Hi everyone and welcome to uh, Office Hours for this month. We are very pleased to have you with us as always um, and we are diving into another very fun topic, uh, continuing on a little bit from our conversation last month where we started to think critically about peer review and um, what that can look like when we think about it differently for open textbooks. And this time we're going to be talking about a different kind of review which is classroom review. Um, that's sometimes also referred to as beta testing and uh, there are lots of different facets to it that we're going to explore today. As always, uh, we are joined by OTN in partnership in running these calls. Oh, I should say I'm Zoe from Rebus Community, for those of you who don't know me, uh, and I will hand over to my lovely co-host Karen to introduce our speakers today. Thank you, Zoe. I am Karen from the Open Textbook Network. And as Zoe said, we're going to talk about classroom review today. And we are joined by three guests. First, Ian McDermott, who's coordinator of library instruction and associate professor at LaGuardia Community College at the City University of New York, otherwise known as CUNY. Uh, Jared Robinson, research associate at McGill University and former primary researcher for the Open Education Group and also Andre Mount, who's Associate Professor of Music Theory at the Crane School of Music at State University of New York, known as SUNY Potsdam. So we're going to hear from each of our three guests for around five minutes. You um, are welcome to put any notes or thoughts or questions in the chat, um, but we will hold those until all of our uh, guests have had a moment to talk about their work in classroom review. And then we will turn things over to all of you to uh, drive this conversation. And to get things started, I'm going to turn things over to Jared Robinson. Hey, thanks for that, Karen. I appreciate it. So I'm Jared Robinson, and um, I was first introduced to OPEN um, when I was doing my dissertation and my um, doctoral research work um, back at the OPEN Education Group at Brigham Young University. And my advisor was David Wiley. Um, and, and so when we were um, doing work together, we were, were thinking about open educational resource quality and specifically um, textbook quality. And, and we thought about it um, on kind of four dimensions. We, were, we did research that looked at the costs, um, outcomes, use, how we use textbooks, and how students and teachers perceive the textbooks. And I think um, peer review um, of open materials um, really connects with how we use and how we, uh, how we perceive the materials and, and when we start to use the materials um, differently this can affect outcomes as well which I think is really really exciting. Um, after finishing my PhD I moved over into state government where I worked for the Michigan Department of Education um, and, and one of the fun experiences that I had there was um, to be part of the advisory committee for our state's Go Open um, work as well um, and then we're recently relocated to Montreal um, where I work at McGill University. My wife is an assistant professor here um, at McGill University as well. One of the interesting experiences that I'll use to just kind of frame how I think about this was um, in a project management course I took in graduate school from David Wiley. I don't know um, if people on the call know David, but um, he's a good friend. And, and he taught project management in kind of an interesting way. And he took a project management open textbook for the construction industry and the project for our class was to convert the construction industry project management open textbook into an instructional design for learning open textbook. And so for us, this put us in a really unique position as learners right from the beginning where we were expected to become experts enough on our content that we could adopt project management to a completely new context. And that was a really transformative learning experience. Um, one that ended with a product that hopefully we could share out and would be useful um, at the end of the day, which we, we ended up doing. So um, when I think about peer review of open, um, open materials, that's one of the experiences um, that has 
that I think about. And then a second experience is with uh, the group that I work with at McGill University right now, which is actually in the Faculty of Dentistry, um, training dentists. Um, and then also training dental researchers. Um, and so Mary Ellen McDonald, who's a professor um, that I work very closely with, Dr. McDonald, with her graduate students, um, engages in group peer review of academic articles. And one of the things that academics um, do is, is peer review um, the research and academic science of their peers. Um, and that helps to create a quality assurance. And it can be pretty intimidating to jump into to thinking about quality. Um, and so she does this as a guided practice with scaffolding, um, with the opportunity to do it together um, in dialogue um, in the cohort. And, and this ends up being a really meaningful experience. Um, so I, th Karen, thanks for posting that book too. Anyways, these are, these are just a couple of the different um, experiences that I think about when I think about that. And I wanted to just use those to introduce myself a little bit in my work. Thanks, Jared. Speaking of scaffolding, we are now going to hear from Ian McDermott, who is coordinator of library instruction, associate professor at LaGuardia Community College. I already said that, but for some reason, I just wanted to say your whole title again, Ian. I'm going to turn things over to you now. You are still muted. All right, I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Great. Um, yeah, thanks so much for, uh, for the invite. Happy to be talking to everybody today. Um, I wanna start, actually, I'll just make a very quick plug. Um, I just uh, had an article published yesterday in, in the library with the lead pipe. That's a, uh, a critical evaluation of OER efficacy studies, which is you know, adjacent to what we're talking about today, but um, certainly provides some context with how I approach OER and how my colleagues and I approach it from more of a critical pedagogy perspective. Um, but what I wanted to focus on with, with my, my brief remarks is a, a seminar that I ran with my colleagues, uh, Christopher McHale and Stephen Ovedia at LaGuardia Community College in spring of 2018. Um, we, we taught students uh, textbook evaluation skills based on the Association of College and Research Library Information Literacy Framework. And then what we did is um, comparative evaluations between commercial and OER textbooks for three gateway STEM classes taught at LaGuardia. Um, and that was a, a, um, a bio class, algebra, and uh, anatomy and physiology. And so the goal for our seminar with these students wasn't so much to um, gather and analyze data so much as it was to test and develop survey instruments. Um, so we tested all of these instruments out and then packaged them together into a toolkit that we've now made available as an OER um, through CUNY Academic Works, which is our institutional repository. It's also up on um, GitHub. Um, so it's, it's, you know, available for everybody to use however they see fit. So we were really trying to get at these different survey and evaluation methods with the students um, and just kind of see, see what might work. So I'll just briefly run through um, some of the survey instruments and uh, evaluation techniques that we used. Um, we did pre and post surveys, uh, which were designed mostly to collect data about the participants. Um, also, I just want to very quickly clarify that the students who participated in this seminar were paid. So this was part of a state grant from New York State. Um, and we wanted the students to be paid kind of as interns, as opposed to it being a, a for credit class, um, <clears throat> just so everyone knows kind of how students were. So we, we interviewed them. We put out a call, we interviewed them, and then they were, they were selected to participate. Um, so the, yeah, so the pre and post survey was really just to kind of gather um, data about them, but also address their academic experiences, uh, their study habits, and their textbook preferences. And the questions from, for this survey were, were primarily adapted from the CUNY Zero Textbook Cost Student Experience Survey, which there's been at least one article published from data gathered by that CUNY-wide survey. Um, uh, I think the lead authors are Shauna, Professor Shauna Brandle and um, Stacey Katz. 
Um, we also looked at the community college survey of student engagement and the uh, collegiate student assessment of textbooks. Um, and so we were kind of using these as uh, like a kind of inspiration slash template. So we were sometimes just using the questions directly and other times ad adopting them for our own particular audience. Um, then we had a mix of quantitative and qualitative textbook assessment surveys. Um, on the quantitative side, we had a uh, approximately like a, uh, like a 25 question survey that used a, an eight point Likert scale from zero to seven. And uh, we used questions from the textbook assessment and usage scale, which was uh, developed by uh, Grung and Martin and then Grung and Landrum in two different publications. Um, and we administered these throughout the seminar. And the way we did it is so that in addition to these uh, three gateway classes, we basically gave the students a chapter from each type of textbook, commercial and OER. And they were, they were put into groups. So like one group would be working on biology, anatomy and physiology and algebra. And so they kind of worked in cohorts. So they were taking these uh, surveys, the qualitative and quantitative, independent of each other um, in these three week uh, kind of groupings. And then what they would do is they would come back, so they would do some remote work and then they would come back in to the, the seminar with, um, for like kind of focus groups and in-depth discussions that we ran with them. So since I'm running out of time, I'll just say that in addition to the, the surveys, we also had them write final reviews um, and kind of like a, that was based on the, actually the, the OTN model that you use kind of mashed up with an Amazon review. So ultimately we were trying to get students to see how they were responding in all of these different um, survey instruments, you know, what kind of, what, and, but most importantly, how did, how were they reacting to using these different instruments? You know, did they like doing qualitative versus quantitative? Did they enjoy writing reviews or participating in focus groups? Um, and as you can imagine, that created a lot more data than we could really like crunch in a timely manner. So we've really been focused on like packaging the, the assessment tools and getting them out there for others to use while we very slowly go through some of the data and begin to write it up. So I'm happy to answer more questions about that um, in the Q&A portion. Great, thank you, Ian. And now Andre, we will hand things over to you. Uh, hi, thanks Karen for the introduction. Um, I am, uh, I think, relatively new to OER, but I'm excited to be a part of this conversation since I'm hoping it's going to help uh, shape how I can collect uh, some review information from my students. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, my project. Um, I have uh, recently completed writing an OER music theory textbook. Uh, to give you all a little background information on the project, this started about a decade ago. Uh, when I was in grad school, I was hired to write a series of texts for some online remedial modules for transfer students in our department. Uh, the idea was that students would take a diagnostic exam and then uh, we would give them topics to review. Uh, eventually the project sort of fizzled. We had a couple of bad hires with web developers uh, and lost funding, but years later, uh, we realized that, uh, or I realized that we had enough material for a textbook and so uh, started going around uh, going about organizing this, uh, filling in the gaps, and just sort of reconfiguring everything. Um, so a couple of years ago, I started working with Allison Brown, who is uh, lurking out there right now, uh, who is the uh, Digital Publishing Services Manager at uh, Open SUNY uh, Textbooks. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've uh, gone through the peer review process, uh, assembled a small team of reviewers to look at everything from the entire book to just the uh, examples and the exercises that are in the textbook, um, which is a great, uh, super helpful part of the project. Um, uh, the next phase was to uh, get it out to some proofreaders, um, but I was eager to get it into the classroom to avoid uh, another year of my students having to pay for a textbook, um, and so decided to take it out for a test run, and that's what I've been doing this year. Um, given that this was concurrent with the proofreading phase of the project, 
I was a little concerned, despite having read through the whole thing, uh, several hundred, uh, 800 or so pages uh, out loud to myself several times, uh, I was a little wary because I knew there were still going to be some typos in there. And my concern was uh, running the risk of students encountering these typos in the textbook, uh, maybe losing faith in the textbook, and then uh, maybe even losing faith in me as an instructor by extension of that. Um, but I decided I think it was worth it to go ahead with this. And so I had to come up with a strategy for uh, 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 addressing that. And the strategy that I came up with was to rather than let them just encounter uh, any problems with the book as they were reading it, to uh, call their attention to that, to say from the get-go uh, that they may encounter these things. And uh, during the first couple of days of class, talk to them a little bit about the OER development process uh, and sort of tried to sell them on the idea of joining in this noble cause themselves and being a part of uh, the whole thing. Um, and also incentivizing it a little bit by offering some extra credit points if they uh, found typos for exams. Um, and so the way it ended up playing out was when students found errors in the textbook, either you know, typos or broken images or audio, they would report it to me. Uh, and I would keep a running list going on our uh, LMS so that they could see uh, where these typos were. I ended up actually changing them in the text, but leaving the original problematic part there just with a red strike through so that I'm not making any changes in the middle of a semester. And so far, most of the feedback that I've been gathering has been this kind of stuff and informal conversations. Um, I wanted to wait until the students had been with the text for a whole year, a whole academic year before trying to get their impressions. And that's where I'm at right now, trying to formulate where or how, what questions I'm going to be asking them in a more formal survey at the end of the semester. Um, the, the reason I told you about the origins of the book was because one of my big concerns is that uh, I want it to be a cohesive text, but it started off as a series of disconnected lessons. And I'm hoping that having read through the book and using it in the classroom the way they did, that the students will have a pretty good uh, perspective on whether or not it works to, as a textbook, as a cohesive whole. So that's where I'm at right now. And uh, like I said, I'm excited to be a part of this conversation because this is gonna help me uh, shape my survey of the students at the end of the semester. Great, thank you, Andre. Well, we have heard from our three guests, so this is the point when we turn things over to all of you and invite your comments and questions. You're welcome to unmute or use chat, whichever you prefer. While you think of those questions, um, Ian, I'm wondering if uh, you have any early findings from that trove of data um, pointing to, you know, how students did experience those different qualitative and quantitative quantitative surveys and other tools that you used. Any previews you can give us? Oh, wait, you're still muted. Um, oh, thanks. So a few things that I would share, I, I guess I would, I would share some kind of unexpected findings. And again, this is, you know, this is one group of students, you know, 18 students, so it's a small sample size, but um, nonetheless, I think it, it, it can be kind of illuminating. Uh, one thing that I that we were very surprised to find is how much the students cared about design in the textbooks, mm. um, down to like font size. You know, like they would, like for example, we were using a uh, the I believe it was the in the OpenStax bio book has been adopted by um, University of British Columbia. And so we, just as a kind of like interesting test, we used both of those, even though they were very similar, but they there were some changes in the Canadian version. But through that adoption process, there were some subtle changes to the design that the students were kind of frustrated by. Um, and I think it was like font size, some pages content had been changed, so like half of the page would be empty. And so I think that there were maybe some perceptions of like, what what is, you know, why is, why is half of a page wasted? What is this book? I think it just kind of like made some red flags for them that were a little surprising as far as like kind of perceptions um, of the quality perhaps are concerned. So that was, that was one thing that was surprising. And the, and the other was that um, they weren't nearly as uh, 
<laughs> probably weren't nearly as militant as I am about wanting there to be no cost for textbooks. You know, a lot of them, I mean, I think some of them are just so accustomed to paying so much for their textbooks that their idea of what a fair price is for a textbook was actually like, you know, you know, 45 up to $75. They often perceive that to be like somewhat fair, um, I think based on their previous experiences. You know, they weren't just like coming in with, you know, free or nothing, um, which was a little surprising to us. But as we got to talk to them more, you know, some of it, like I said, was their past experience, but some of it I think was like, they were, they're very like thoughtful, reasonable students who, you know, understand that there is cost in producing textbooks. And that was something we spoke with them a lot about was like the, the, the academic labor that goes into this, you know, whether it's a commercial publisher or a university or, uh, you know, a, a nonprofit or philanthropic organization. Um, but, you know, that's why we wanted to pay them for their participation, you know, so we tried to um, bring those labor practices in. And so they were very uh, attuned to those issues. Thanks, Ian. Two good takeaways so far about design and cost flexibility. Andre, you mentioned that you're getting to the stage of asking your students about their experience more holistically with the text. Do you have a starter list of questions, things that you know you want to ask? Yeah, I'm starting to devise that. It's a, kind of a busy semester, so that's on the back burner. But uh, like I said, a lot of it, I think it's just going to have to do with the cohesiveness of the whole thing. But then there's some other stuff. One of our reviewers, prior to taking it to the classroom, uh, we had uh, one person who was looking specifically at the activities, uh, the little exercises that we have embedded in the text. Um, and they have a lot of uh, very useful uh, feedback on that. But I think that even so, I mean, this was another music theory instructor. Um, I think that it's gonna take the student's actual experience working through those exercises to really find out how effective they were. I'm interested to see if they did the exercises. They're just kind of self-graded things and they're in little drop down, you know, expandable uh, divs in the, uh, on, the, on the screen. And it's, I think it's really easy to just scroll right past them, despite my encouraging them to do this kind of thing. And so I'm curious to find out, and hopefully they'll be honest with me, uh, how many of them actually did the exercises if they felt like they were rele relevant to the text, because I think that's, they're the only ones that are gonna know. Those are, they're the only ones that are gonna be able to give me uh, that information. So that's what most of my concern is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting any, major uh, changes suggested by the students. Um, and I think at this point, I wouldn't be ready to make any major changes. I would wanna you know, do a public release first, um, but uh, to begin collecting some of that, that information. I, I, there haven't been any major alarms so far using the book. Uh, and so I'm not anticipating anything dramatic, but um, I am thinking about uh, that, 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 that possibility and how to kind of organize that, that data once I get it from the students. And you hinted a bit at your fear of students losing faith if they were to find typos, and so you engage them in kind of that hunt. Have you heard any um, or seen any evidence of that fear being realized, or do you think that that was more um, imagined than real? I, I think my plan worked because uh, they do seem very enthusiastic about just the idea of OER. Uh, and really, really enthusiastic to, uh, to, to be a part of it and to contribute to it as well. Um, and so I haven't seen any of, uh, any of my worst fears realized so far anyway. Fingers are still crossed. Yeah, it's interesting to note, you know, between your story and Ian's research, you know, students who are more removed from the creation of the OER, who are evaluating it, but not necessarily as a first person student, might be more critical of the design or why does it look like this or what happened during adaptation. Whereas with that relationship in the classroom with the instructor and being invited, you know, to contribute to the creation of it, it seems like it's a different experience and they're like, hey, we all make typos. It's all right. Yeah, and I think I think they're uh, just the distraction of being in the class. You know, I mean, that's their 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 primary concern is doing well in the class. 
And right. so you, you, they don't have that, that level of removal from it to really be critical in the same way, I would imagine. Right, which gets to your other uh, age old question of whether it counts. And if it doesn't count, if students are actually doing those exercises for their benefit or not, if, it, if they're optional. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm interested uh, to follow up in here uh, what kind of completion rate those exercises may have had. Yeah. So, um, Matt, I see that you turned your camera on. Do you want to go ahead and ask the question that you posted in the chat? Or not? No. Okay. You're in a loud place, maybe, where they serve breakfast. Okay. Um, so, got it. <laughs> so, uh, Matt's question in the chat, does anyone have suggestions about students leading their own evaluation of a textbook? I'm, evalu I'm evaluating my research methods textbook. So designing focus group questions is part of our learning process anyway. I'm less clear on how to facilitate that process or work with them on developing a focus group script, especially since it's my book. I may not be the most objective to lead those groups since I'm also grading the students. What kind of thoughts do any of you have for Matt? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. And then, um, you know, I'm not teaching students right now, so um, kind of speaking from a... Um, you know, just brainstorming perspective or, or conceptual perspective. Uh, you know, um, my background is research methodology, and um, there's not a right way to present that information. And I think, Matthew, you know that um, really well, that there are myriad ways um, to think about um, these kinds of things. And, and, and um, so, you know, one of the things that I think is really helpful the students are capable of leading that work, but give them concrete things that you want to see. So break, you know, the ideas that I would think about like instructionally are breaking this textbook up into pieces and then assigning groups to actually make recommendations to improve each piece and just expect that each piece could be improved or that you might not take their, um, take recommendations. But I, I think this is important for a couple of reasons to give students the opportunity to think about how to improve and build on this. The first, um, is when we adopt an open textbook, I think we kind of acknowledge tacitly that the value proposition of um, the textbook is changing. Um, that, that information is so widely available and we can learn from so many different sources that it's hard for us to justify asking students to pay 80 or $180 for a textbook. Um, information isn't shared that way outside of academic settings very often. Um, and, and I think we also acknowledge then that the value of them sitting in a class and getting that information from us is changing too. So in addition to just giving content, we have to be giving skills that are important um, and are gonna be important to them as well. And, and the openness of the textbook gives us an opportunity to, to really take a skill approach and invite them into a professional moment where they actually exert professional skills and abilities um, on that. So what the kind of proposition that you're asking, Matthew, is that exact thing that we can ask students to do. And if I think about like 21st century skills that are really important, um, evaluating information is at the top of my personal list. Misinformation is such a problem. Um, uh, and, and so giving students in any discipline, any field, any content, the ability to say, how is this information presented? Could we do it better? Um, does, is there other information that triangulates that? Um, is the kind of thought, the thought pattern that's increasingly valuable at the same time that like the text itself is not as valuable as it used to be? So I think that that's all you know, extremely worthwhile. Yeah, I, I love that, uh, that thought around skills that you have, Jared, and that came up for me as soon as you were talking about the students who are undertaking a form of peer review within their classroom. So that, that, you know, there's a conversation just recently on Twitter about a lot of, you know, grad students who then move into, into academic fields who aren't trained in a lot of really key skills, like knowing how to do peer review. And I think, uh, you know, pre-review groups are a really great way to start engaging with that. But I think bringing the focus of classroom review into what are the students learning out of it? What is the value of this? Because there's immediate value to, to the person writing the textbook, right? Like you're gonna get a lot out of it, a bunch of feedback, you're gonna make it a, a stronger resource. That's gonna have a better impact on students who use it in future. Um, but that idea of shaping it around very specifically, what skills are we wanting to teach them? What, what should they be practicing? What should they be learning? As part of this process, I think that process is super important. So, 
So Lee has a question for all of us to imagine. And Lee, I may need to ask for your clarification. Um, in the chat, you suggested that uh, we consider what would happen if we held up classroom review the way we hold up peer review. And um, I'm not sure if you mean hold up, you mean for scrutiny in terms of uh, trying to standardize or examine. I just want to make sure that I'm getting this right. I think I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you no, you over, <laughs> sorry, Zoe and I are in the same room. <laughs> okay. um, I think what I mean by held up is give credence to and hold as important and vital to the publishing process. I see. So how would, um, I, thank you for clarifying. So how would things look different for us if classroom review were heralded or held up or really lauded as an important part of the textbook production process? How might that shift things? Well, I can talk to that a little bit. I, I think it's just, uh, it's a different part of it. Uh, for the peer review that we had done, and these are other uh, experts in the subject matter, and so I'm taking their perspective uh, in a certain way. The students are, their, their input on my project anyway is of a different nature. It's a more, I think, practical nature based on their own experiences. And so for me, for my project, it's really got to be a kind of combination of the two. Um, and so uh, in a way, they're both uh, as important as the other. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of like a, a spectrum of how this could work too, whether it's you want uh, feedback from students, like one of the outcomes we had initially hoped for through our seminar was to, um, uh, create a uh, some some kind of plugin perhaps that would work with uh, the CUNY Academic Commons, which is like WordPress, you know, open software that people are teaching with. Not not exclusively far from it, but but more and more te people are teaching with that could be used for evaluating um, a textbook at the end of the semester, for example, on the kind of OTN review model. Um, but you know, at this, I think on the other hand, if you wanted to use more like open pedagogy techniques, you know, that can that can just become a more involved process where you're not just getting feedback, but you're sort of continually um, sort of revising and creating the textbook with your students, um, you know, over the course of the semester. Like the purpose, it could just be this kind of like ongoing iterative process where the creation of the textbook is kind of like part of the class itself. Um, as opposed to, you know, traditional feedback, revisions, re-release for the next semester. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but just that I think it all depends on what you, how you would want to approach it as far as like how much we want to, um, you know, to kind of try and uh, address how we want to hold it up as peer review. You know, do we want them to be active participants in the creation of the book or do we want, you know, or do we want their feedback so that we can improve, improve upon it ourselves? Yeah, and um, Rebel posted something in the chat related to that peer review um, comparison and whether or not um, you guys are thinking about uh, sort of the trade-offs on whether things are a blind review or at what stage they may be a blind review for what particular type of feedback. And she raises the concern that, you know, it might be difficult as a student to tell your professor this, this book is disjointed or it's not working for me or I'm really struggling with it if they know that obviously you have um, power in that relationship with grading and their future. Um, so I invite your comments on that. I think there's, uh, there's an element of uh, when, 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 when I ask my students for feedback, I uh, tell them that if they think, uh, uh, if, if they think the book sucks, I want to know that it sucks and I want to know why it sucks. Um, and so I think that uh, this has been a part of my project, at least uh, since deciding to go in the OER direction, that it ended up being a much more collaborative thing. When we uh, found our peer reviewers, my initial thought was that we would do blind review because my understanding at the time was that was the kind of standard for books in my field anyway. 
And then in discussions with Allison, we decided to not do blind review. And I think that was a really good uh, move because it made it a more collaborative process, which I hadn't previously been, that wasn't really on my radar before. Um, but I think that the book benefited from that a lot. And so I took that same kind of uh, perspective in approaching my students about this. Uh, and so uh, the, w w whether or not it's blind, for me anyway, is irrelevant because I, I want to know the good, I want to know the bad. And so uh, I think that element is kind of removed from it when it's a more collaborative process like this. Yeah, although I mean, it's worth mentioning too that like a lot of that's idiosyncratic to the power dynamic that's just in a specific classroom, right? Because I, I've been in situations where um, we were invited to review professors' work, and and that ended up being uncomfortable or hostile. And I don't even know if the professor knew it, right? That that we might be, it, it's possible for us to to conduct this on our own work in a way that's inviting and open and people feel confident, but, you know, we should be realistic that this might be, I think it's a really good consideration, right? You might be able to do things with someone else's textbook, right? If you're bringing in an open textbook that you didn't create, that might, you might have opportunities to use um, peer review pedagogically in ways that would be threatening if it were your own work. Um, and being empathetic to the student experience is really important. Listening to Jared, I imagined a situation where a colleague implemented, um, you know, a, a peer's, a, a, another colleague's uh, textbook in the classroom and then provided that feedback. Um, so they're, they're sort of the conduit, they're, they're one step removed, and then the potentials for awkwardness in that relationship. So, you know, it's hard to get around it no matter where you are, but at least the, the power differential is, is uh, perhaps less pronounced. Um, Matt, uh, following up on, on Lee's question, which got us started down this road, has anyone ever seen a classroom review index similar to a peer review index in an open textbook? I can't think of any. Anyone out there? Our guests and beyond? I'm, I'm going to go see if I can find an example. I think one thing that we've spoken a lot about with, with projects at Rebus is including a peer review statement and uh, alongside that a classroom review statement explaining the process that's been through. I'm trying to think whether many of those are actually released and, and available, um, so I'll go looking for one. Um, but that's something that we've, we've tried to, to put into the, the, the process that projects we work with go through is thinking about them on the same keel for very different purposes. And I think um, this might speak a little bit to your question, Jonathan, about the difference between peer review and classroom review. Uh, with peer review, particularly for scholarly work, maybe a little different for textbooks, but it's kind of about finding truth. We think of it as that's the validation of the, the information, it's the expertise, it's, it's the expert review of it. And then classroom review is a space that is very dedicated to thinking about, okay, how does that information actually, actually work in practice? Um, and, and so peer review can get to that too, I think, especially in, in open textbooks. Often, you know, the kind of collaborative process that Andre's thinking of, you know that all of those people were also interested in how this was going to impact students. It's not out of the equation. Um, and I think what classroom review offers is the space to really do that very deliberately and kind of, so you've been through the, yep, okay, we know the information in here is, is, is correct, is as good as we can get it right now. How does it actually play out in the classroom setting? Um, and yeah, you know, that is something that, that, as I say, is important for us that we do think of those as both being important because you can have the best information in the world, it can be completely accurate. And if students zone out while reading it and don't do any of the activities and don't get anything out of it, then it isn't actually achieving its, its goal as a, as a text or as, as an object. So uh, I think that slightly speaks to what Jonathan asked, but I would open it up to anybody else who wants to talk about those differences between peer review and classroom review and, and how you kind of think about it. All right, I'm gonna read Matt's comment in the chat. because I, really I think I'm not good at asking questions because I just sort of like talk and then I'm like, somebody else talk about this. <laughs> Let's hand back to Cash. <laughs> so um, just to, to um, come back around to this idea of, you know, working with students and whether or not they may 
um, feel inhibited in offering feedback about um, a book created by their instructor. One of the ways that Matt has dealt with it is by bringing students onto the research team to lead the evaluation process and co-create the questions. So the focus group is facilitated by a student rather than the professor and getting IRB approval and consent forms that indicate the data won't be shared with the professor until after the class. So putting some safeguards in place or making the whole process very um, transparent. Um, sounds like that's been, <laughs> or semi-transparent based on that head shake has been helpful for Matt. So um, Jonathan, I'm, I'm gonna take a look at your comment here. Another aspect is purely the positive relationship building. For example, I've done the bug bounty approach extra credit points for typos found in my OER during the first semester of deployment, much like Andre talked about. And I've never had such careful reading of the textbook as when looking for these bugs or typos, um, sort of a, um, a treasure hunt, if you will. I'm thinking of introducing new typos, even in a stable version being reused in class just to get that effect again. So maybe we're stumbling onto a, a very helpful pedagogical device here, <laughs> which is the insertion of typos. And maybe a research question too, right? Like the kinds of, you know, the stance you take if you're doing a typo review or like just trying to improve the, the text, um, you know, you prime students and how they and how they engage and are motivated to engage and, and then ultimately, you know, what they're gleaning from that. So it might be useful to think about like different ways to prime and, and then do cognitive interviews with students. Hey, I you know, what was your experience when you were reading, looking for typos in mind? Did that, how did that um, affect with your understanding of the concepts? Um, was it really helpful? Did it get in the way? Um, what, how else could I prime this? Because um, I think that's one of the benefits, right, of this is if students are reading with purpose and, and we have the opportunity to give purpose, like, um, you know, this, my, my background is as an English teacher. I taught high school English for six years before um, jumping back on the academic sides of things and, and trying to like help my students approach uh, a text with purpose um, was most of the work uh, of, of being an English teacher. So I, I, I'm really interested in that idea. Don't have any good answers about it though. Well, one thing that we did in the seminar right in the beginning that we found was extremely useful was to basically cover like the anatomy of a textbook, you know, cause like a lot of students may not know what all of the component parts of the book, you know, what purpose they serve, you know, what's a glossary, what's the index. Um, and I know that there, there's a handout and maybe even some slides of that unit that we taught in the seminar in our toolkit. But, um, you know, we found that to be incredibly useful as like a, a way to start the seminar because it really, their skills, their, their, their analysis skills are really sharp, um, period. But I think that getting some of that background information to kind of help them understand like this is how we're looking at these books, you know, this is how they're traditionally constructed. Um, I just find, you know, working as a librarian at a community college that like we can't assume any prior knowledge um, that's not, that's not, that's not to discredit students so much as it's just like, at least where we are in, in New York city, they're coming from such diverse backgrounds and academic experiences in their lives that like, just sort of like doing that kind of fundamental review is very helpful for everybody and just helps clarify what we're looking for when it comes to like a review or an evaluation, um, of the textbook. Um, and then one other thing I just wanted to briefly touch on that, that came up a, a couple minutes ago the IRB and getting students involved. I think that's a really great idea too. When, when we've um, presented at conferences on this, this toolkit, we've typically brought at least one of the students who participated in the seminar with us to, to talk about the toolkit. And that's been a really great way to, you know, um, you know, build rapport even more and just get, you know, get them some lines on their CV early on. Uh, you know, one of them wound up getting a really, amazing um cook scholarship for community college students it's very great you know scholarship and uh he's moved on to uh, haverford so it was just like it was amazing you know to kind of see that trajectory um and you know i know one of my co-collaborators like wrote one of his letters of recommendation for that scholarship so we really tried to like forge relationships with them when when possible very rewarding to do so yeah. That's why most of us are here. <laughs> I, uh, I love what you bring up, Ian, as well, about um, 
meeting students where they are and, and, and kind of doing a bit of education before embarking on this. And I think this kind of connects back to uh, what Rebel raised. And I think it's really important that as this work is being undertaken, there's an understanding that, you know, your students all bring different experiences and levels of knowledge about these things. And I think, uh, you know, what Andre did in, in terms of starting off by being really transparent about the process. And I think that's also about trust building in the classroom. And this, I, I, you know, is, is very relevant in conversations about open pedagogy. It, if you start by building trust in the classroom um, and that, you know, there are mechanisms to do so, which can include things like uh, allowing for anonymous feedback or, you know, making sure that students know they won't be punished for not participating, giving them agency in whether or not they participate, how they participate, uh, you know, they're by providing a lot of options for them to be navigate through and then supporting them to make those decisions with the right information. I think that's really relevant here too. And in particular, you know, when, as has been mentioned, there's that power dynamic involved. Uh, you know, there are a lot of students who, who come into a classroom like that who won't have, have say experienced a, a, a relationship with an instructor where they're trying to be more egalitarian and, and, and try and, and do things differently. Um, everybody, you know, brings their own experiences to this and, and it's important to think about the ways in which we're deliberate about making sure that students do feel safe and included and also feel like they won't be punished for not participating or participating and, and you know, having critique to give, um, you know, the, the, who you're meeting in the classroom. It's the, you know, teach the students that you have, not the ones you think you have. Um, and I'm probably slightly messing up that, that quote from someone. Um, but I think that's, that's really critical here. All right, I'm just going to mention that we're about 10 minutes before the hour. So if you've been holding on to any questions or comments, now is the time to put them out there. Also, I invite any of you, in addition to our three guests, if you um, want to share a particular case study or something that you have tried uh, yourself or supported an author in trying themselves in the classroom, uh, please don't hesitate to tell us about it. Let's see, Rebel has a couple comments in the chat um, for Jonathan, a faculty member at Kansas State who had a similar experience with the popularity of finding typos in a textbook. Uh, he actually had to limit the extra credit, but that they um, read it very closely. Um, she also mentions we had one anonymous book complaint form that collected all errors and issues to address after the semester. It saved all entries into a spreadsheet and then she could address those that were most critical first and still track all issues in one place. So this is a really great tool um, after publication to share somewhere perhaps in the front matter or back matter of the book so that you can hear from people out there who are using your book and um, get that kind of input. Um, Matt mentions that he credited a student as a contributor because unprompted he read, um, proofread the entire book, which is a big deal and brought in sheets of paper with all the errors in each class. This person may have found their calling. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pause and see if um, there's anyone else who would like to speak up before we start to um, say our goodbyes. It's not too late. <laughs> Ian, here's a question in the chat from Jonathan. Is the toolkit mentioned earlier a good place to look for resources that we can use to do surveys to prove to funding agencies that OER um, are good? If I, I think I got that right. It's um, maybe. I guess it depends on how you want to use the surveys or, or you know, adapt them to your own use um but it's definitely you know as uh, i think perhaps some of jared's work on the coop framework is probably a bit more applicable to that kind of like proof of ex you know proof of existence or existence justification type work that i think a lot of the um the literature gets into 
so maybe maybe in hours, but I, but I'm, I'd be curious if if, if Jared Jared probably has a, a clearer sense of that. Yeah, I mean you're going to triangulate. No, no, absolutely not. I, I I think student perceptions can be valuable. Um, you know, we found that student perceptions oftentimes they rated open textbooks um, in different contexts very highly. Um, they they were less critical than we expected, even when we knew that like there were design issues. Um, and then sometimes students are really focused on design issues, I, like you alluded to earlier, that they care about those where content was the thing that we were hoping that they'd zero in on. So triangulating is really important. Um, add to student perceptions, um, you know, getting multiple faculty to give perceptions is another way to triangulate that. Um, to triangulate that, and then. Um, you know, we, we've thought about outcomes and we've done some quasi-experimental work and, and, and certainly with a little bit of design um, and, and thinking ahead, it's, you have the ability to kind of ask our students learning as well, especially if you're using like the same text over multiple years with different text, uh, textbooks. That's not going to give you the whole answer either, um, just because the design is not going to be likely super strong. But um, if you're using that to triangulate, you've got different ways of, of looking at it. As well, but I think the most exciting thing is is what how were you able to use it differently, um, and 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 this peer review part and to be able to pick it apart and, and add to it and change it. Um, that's I, if I were trying to make the case to funders, I I would be talking about um, how we're using it and the, how openness changes how we use it, um, and peer review would be a big part of that. I I think that that's a really compelling story to tell. Yeah, it's. Because I'm I'm just thinking back to some of the things we did in the in the seminar, and that um, you know, like when early on we showed them a uh, the most heavily circulated reserve textbooks in our library, and not coincidentally, those textbooks were you know on average like 120 to you know 300 dollars. And so we broke it down by like, well, the cost is one impediment. So like those are circulating a lot because perhaps students aren't buying them. Um, another then is like, there's basically like three publishers, you know? So like we kind of, we, we really dug into those, like all, all, like almost all of the authors were men, you know, it was just kind of like, look at these books. Are they reflective of, you know, the students here? Um, you know, how expensive are they? And, you know, that, that's like not necessarily proving that OER is good but it is at least pointing out the problem, you know, it's addressing the problem and showing that why there at least can be some justification to, you know, test this out um, and to start to introduce them. Um, but, you know, that's just my, because, you know, we were, we were doing this survey, it was, you know, we weren't teaching class, you know, obviously that's a really important part. So we, we perhaps, perhaps were getting more comments on things like design and layout and things like that, because we weren't really, teaching to the content at all. Sure. Yeah, I mean, what I am convinced of after spending time looking at outcomes in particular too is the textbook is a relatively small, no matter how good or bad it is, it's a relatively small part of the learning environment and learning outcomes as well. So, you know, um, you know being realistic about that, um, that, that it's how we're going to teach it. It's how we're going to engage with students um, and how students will engage with us. You know, how we promote engagement is going to have a lot bigger effect um, than, than the textbook, no matter, no matter what the textbook is. Um, and that's kind of why I think this is all intriguing, like of inviting students to engage as experts, um, as junior experts and not uh, emerging experts um, is, is, is so powerful um, and unique to OER too, that some of the ways that you can do that. Indeed. And I would just say quickly, Jonathan, too, why don't we tell them anyway? Uh, you know, funding agencies set their metrics. If we're doing this work because we see value it in other places, like, yes, it's more work, but let's just, let's just tell them all anyway. Let's start kind of trying to set our own metrics on some of this stuff, too, and keep including it. Make that a part of the case that we're making, the story we're telling every time we're talking to funding agencies, and that might, too, get through a little bit. Yeah. Thanks, Zoe, and um, thanks to our guests. I'm just going to highlight Rebel's story before we wrap up. She mentioned in the chat that at K-State, 
they encouraged a year of class review before official publication. So this um, seems to be an emerging trend and found that the professor author changed the textbook, uh, sometimes quite significantly up to 50% based on student feedback after the first semester to work out the bugs and then reused it another semester with an improved version. And that but by the time they had sort of a, a version ready to go live, um, it had had these two testing sessions. So um, the thank yous are starting to come in, which usually means that we're about at the hour. So I would like to thank all of you for joining us for this conversation today about classroom review. And a special thanks to our guests, Jared Robinson, Ian McDermott, and Andre Mount, and also to Zoe and the team at Rebus. Thank you, Karen. My thanks to everyone as well. And our next office hours is coming up in March and that will be on the use of multimedia in OER. And I'll drop a long link in the chat there for anyone who wants to check that out and all the rest of the details will be coming. Thank you, everyone. This has been a wonderful conversation as always. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Great talking to all of you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.